started. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to today's Paper Space Tech Talk on generating and editing photorealistic images from text prompts using OpenAI's Glide. I'm your host, James Skelton, uh, the evangelist for Paper Space, and I want to thank you all so much for attending today. Really appreciate it. Um, and I apologize, I just realized my screen never shared. <laughs> there we go. Uh, if you aren't familiar with Paperspace Gradient, it's a platform for building and scaling machine learning applications where you can go and explore a new library or data set in uh, one of our notebooks, automate pre-processing, training, or testing with a workflow, and then bring your application to life with a deployment. Um, you, you should definitely consider joining our community of over 500,000 users on Gradient, but I will say that you are going to be joining today to participate anyway, so it seems a little redundant. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer before we get a little further. Uh, the models we're going to be using today are rather large, and they can take a little while to download. So that's why I wanted to start off this conversation with an explanation about that and with setting up the notebook. So if, uh, oh, I have a question in the chat about downloading slides. Yes, you can download the slides. And uh, Sam, I will give a roadmap of the talk in just a bit after we finish the setup. So before we get started, I would like to ask everybody to go to the Gradient console uh, and make an account if you don't already have one and log in if you do. And then I'll show you how to set up the notebook for today. So I'll just give everybody about 30 seconds to go there. Your webinar information. And can I see bees in the chat once everybody is in their console? Just want to make sure. Okay. Appreciate your patience, Nikolash. I'm just going to give it another 10 seconds or so. All right. So this is the gradient consult. This is where we separate out our diff. Oh, got a request for the slides link. That is more important, especially because we need something in there on the third slide. OK, so here is the gradient consult. Um, you can work in whatever team. I'm going to work in my private workspace and project you would like to work in. Um, so let's just, I'm just going to go into ML Showcase staging. Once you're in your project space, you can go to the Notebooks tab by clicking on this tab over here in the top left, but you should be automatically taken there. Um, and then you can go in the top right where it says Create and click that to go into the Notebook creation page. Once you're there, select this first runtime, PyTorch 1.11. This will act as our template for our notebook. And then scroll down to the Select a Machine section. Uh, I would like to tell everybody to pick a free GPU, but I cannot be certain that they will all, uh, you will all have the one available. Um, these are subject to availability. So if you're unable to select a free GPU right now and you'd like to follow along for free, um, feel free to just look at the recording I'll send out and follow along again, or just follow along with the slides. Um, but you should be able to access a free GPU later today if you cannot right now. And you can change the auto shutdown to however long you want for however long you plan to work on this, up to six hours. And then the last thing we need to do for settings is scroll down past that select machine and go to advanced options. There, toggle that and go to where it says workspace URL. Then back in our slides, and I'll put this in the chat too, there is a link on the before we get started page for the gradient AI fork of the Glide text to image repo. Go back into your console with that link and paste it in. And that's all you need to do to do setup and click start notebook. Ah, 
see, out of capacity for the free GPUs. So sorry about that, everybody. Um, if you're on the growth plan, you could also probably access um, the free P5000, RTX 4000, RTX 5000. But uh, if you'd rather follow along for free, you can do so later, or you can choose one of our paid instances, and this should cost you less than a dollar to do. So I'm just going to work on a P4000. Start on my notebook. Can I get uh, bees in the chat that everybody's following along fine here? And I've actually already created a version of this notebook, so I'm going to jump into that. Bees in the chat that the notebook process is working and your notebook is starting up. Got one, good. <laughs> All right. Now it should take about a minute before it says running up here in the top left. This is gonna let you know that your notebook is now ready to go and that you can execute the code in the cells or within the terminal. Can I get uh, a B in the chat once we're running or I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make wait 30 seconds and if it doesn't work, I'll show you what to do. And, and I'll encourage all of you to do that while I'm presenting in the interest of keeping time together. We need to download some of these models for Glide to work onto our machine. And that's what is gonna take that time, somewhere between 20 and 35 minutes, which would take up the duration of our uh, presentation time. All right, we got one running. So I'm gonna assume that everybody else is going to start running soon. So if I could get everybody to please, once your notebook is running, to go into the notebook titled endpaint.ipynb. And once you're there, go ahead and hit run all in the top right corner. What this will do is it will install the uh, Gradient AI Glide text to image library, do our imports and download all the models for us. Okay, I see I have a raised hand. Uh, for the person that raised their hand, could you just put in the chat what you would like to ask? Still raising your hand. I, can't comment directly, sorry. Uh, here's that I left this. It's like I had some sort of error happening with my notebook. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Can I import error? I progress not found. Okay. Uh, I've actually prepared for this contingency. Sorry, I am shocked to see that happen. I turned off the progress bar, so it shouldn't be giving you that error. But if you are getting the import error, I progress not found, uh, go into the notebook titled run Python scripted versions.ipymb. And then you can execute all of the same code that's in that notebook by running this uh, final cell. And that will download everything you need for the in painting notebook. It does the exact same process. Um, I've just put it into a Python script here. Oh, it's good to be prepared. <laughs> um, Uma, can you confirm that that's working? And then we will move on to the slides. I'm just using you as my, uh, my guinea pig here. Executing, wonderful. Okay, so let's jump back into the presentation then. So just uh, keep in mind while I'm talking here to check over that notebook, um, either the inpaint.ipynb or the run scripted versions. And um, 
make sure you run at least that first cell, but the last one. If you're having no files shown on the left panel, try refreshing the page. And Sam, I will send the recording to you. Okay. Uh, somebody is still raising their hand. If you have a question, please put it in the chat or the q and I, I can't, I can't have respond to it. Hmm. Mark, I'm not sure. I had somebody saying they're seeing no files. I'm not sure how that's happening. Um, and another person has raised their hand. I still can't respond to raised hands, y'all. So I'm going to continue on with the presentation. But uh, if you are unable to see your file shown, try making a new notebook. Uh, if the refresh isn't working, that is a very, that's unusual. I've made a notebook for Glide a few times now and I haven't run into that problem. So if it keeps happening, uh, feel, feel free to email me after the session here and I'll try and help work through that. But we need to move on with the rest of the presentation in the interest of everybody's time. So let's jump into the overview for today. We're going to get started with a brief uh, conversation about image synthesis and what it is. Then we're going to jump into talking about some of the other options for image synthesis and why I recommend using Glide and what are some of the use cases for Glide. Then I'll go over introducing Glide, talking about how it works on a, in, a, in a rough way, then more uh, granularly break down how some of its components work, specifically the ablated diffusion model and how it uses text prompts. And then we will put it all together. Um, after that, we'll discuss some of the capabilities this enables for us, uh, including image generation and in painting, and then close with a live, live demo on the notebook that you all just set up. OK. Give me one moment. Sorry, everybody. Some formatting issues on my other monitor. Here we go. Okay, so image synthesis, what is it? Um, you can think of image synthesis as the process of artificially generating images that contain some specific content designated by the synthesis overseer, so to speak. Um, so in Lyman's terms or simple terms, we're making pictures from nothing that contain some specific thing that we are telling it to contain. Uh, image synthesis, excuse me. Image synthesis has a broad appeal for both research and business use cases. Uh, think about medical data, like uh, you're in a situation with a rare disease and you can now take a very limited data set of images of this rare disease and create a much larger one that realistically captures what that uh, disease shows in the imaging. Or uh, think about in marketing, you could avoid the need for ever having to buy stock photos because you could just generate photorealistic headshots of people doing whatever you need them to do. Or, um, and this one is particularly poignant, I'm sure, the NFT space is an obvious one. Uh, you could use image synthesis to create digital artwork and sell it online. And I know that that has been a popular use uh, after our last session that we had on Clip Pixel Draw. So image synthesis is, usual, is useful, we get that. Um, but why would we want to use any particular model or in this case, Glide? Well, there's a myriad of different ways we can go about actually generating images. Um, some of the popular techniques we are not covering today include, oh, sorry, <laughs> typo. Uh, include like GAN-based models um, like LSGM, which is, uh, latent score generative model um, or deep convolutional generative adversarial networks. Um, these are all just some of the different popular techniques that have been around for a little while. And historically, the best of these models have been GAN-based. Um, the reason Glide is particularly interesting is that it's capable of matching those top performing GAN-based models and even outperform them in a lot of cases. Take a look at the image here on the right, and I'm actually going to go out of here so that we can all get a better look at it in the original paper. 
here we are. So we've got samples of images produced by a bunch of different image synthesis uh, programs. Uh, here is a top layer with the real image. This layer is produced by a model called XMCGAN. Then we have the famous DAL-E. And then we have two examples from Glide. Uh, Glide with Clip Guidance and Glide with their classifier free guidance. Uh, I'll go over this more later, but it's a proprietary system they use to have the model learn the text connections to the image features. Um, all of these were trained on the same MS Coco prompts, or, or, or given the same MS Coco prompts, excuse me, for their generation procedure. And generally speaking, the authors at Glide found that people actually preferred their classifier free guidance produced image, uh, classifier free guidance produced images from Glide over even the, the same model with cl expensive clip re ranking. And I'll talk more about clip in a little bit. So, in a nutshell, Glide does a really, really good job. <laughs> So I've mentioned it several times now, and I'm sure all of you are itching to know what actually is GLIDE? How does it work? What is it really doing? GLIDE stands for Guided Language to Image, Image Diffusion for Generation and Editing. And it was for first released in December of 21 by researchers at OpenAI. So this is a super new um, uh, paradigm for image generation. And it's only been around for a few months. And it was created with the goal of demonstrating the potential of diffusion models in the field of image generation. So as I said before, uh, frequently uh, things like DC GANs or uh, I don't know, variational autoencoder GANs, things like that were topping the, the charts uh, for benchmarks on both qualitative and quantitative metrics for uh, image generation procedures. The people at Glide were able to show conclusively that using a diffusion model, they were able to get close to or better performance on their image generation techniques, and that they were able to even do things like inpainting, which is uh, the notebook that we had started earlier. Inpainting is the process of taking in some sort of image, identifying an area to change, and then making edits to it which is pretty awesome in my opinion. Um, I should mention that the uh, model was trained on Coco style data of images paired with captions um, so that the image features could be linked to text features and that samples from the 3.5 billion parameter text conditional diffusion model using classifier free guidance are favored by human evaluators compared to those from Dolly. So that's like um, what we showed here with this kind of cartoonish dolly versus the photorealism that Glide is able to achieve. So how does it actually work? I've talked about how it can do things like um, make, make an image from some prompt or do these, these in-painting edits, but how does it actually do that? Well, roughly, Glide is trained on that robust data set of images and captions and learns that relationship between the textual and visual features. It does this through diffusion or introducing random noise for each of T steps in the diffusion process to the image and using the changing relationship between the text encoding and the image to understand what the encodings of the text mean for the visual features. By the end of the steps, the image will be entirely noise. So we go from a normal image to a completely noisy, staticky thing. Uh, and then during image synthesis, it uses these learned connections to then reform the visual portions of, of whatever image features we have from a new text prompt and a random noise image. So the end painting here, here shows applying that process to a masked portion of the end painted image, inputted image, excuse me. And, and I really think that is what makes Glide so, so exciting. So now that we understand what Glide is doing, let's look at how it actually does it. To understand that, we need to go into what the component parts of Glide are. 
In particular, we have the ablated diffusion model, uh, otherwise known as the ADMG or ADMU for guided or UNET. Uh, the ablated diffusion model is actually relatively easy to understand for all of these. And if you look on the right, I've actually got some examples of some of the different uh, techniques for doing this kind of generation process. We got GANs, variational autoencoders, flow-based models, and diffusion models. Um, what it does is it starts with an input x0, so at time step zero, and that is your original image. It creates a Markov chain of diffusion steps for, of length t to incrementally introduce random noise to the data before learning to then reverse that diffusion process. So a well-trained model is then able to reconstruct whatever data samples are desired from the noise alone and a text prop. Um, the ADM model specifically used for Glide is a modified ImageNet 64 by 64 model. Um, so that's a UNet. Um, the team scaled the model width to 512 channels. So it's a bit of a scale up and that resulted in about 2.3 billion parameters for the visual portion of the model. It was also modified to have three attention resolution layers at 32 by 32, 16 by 16, and eight by eight. Um, really quick, I just wanna point out what that diffusion kind of looks like here as we step over, and then it shows on the bottom how it would look as it steps back. So it, it, this dotted line represents the approximation that can be created from the noise image after training. Next. So I've talked a little bit about this now, but uh, for, uh, realistically, there are two different stages to understand for the ablated diffusion model and to, in turn, understand how Glide works. First, there is the forward diffusion process. Uh, this is a little backwards on here, so I apologize for that. Um, you can kind of think of it as the reverse of what we're really seeing. But forward diffusion with the ablated diffusion model is where, given a data point sampled from a real data distribution, uh, they add a small amount of Gaussian noise to the sample in T0 to T final steps, and then it eventually produces a sequence of noisy samples. So if we look at this in reverse, we start with X0, and we do the Markov chain adding or noise um, to get towards the noise image. For backwards diffusion, uh, for each step, we can see that the data is noise here for both backwards and forward. Um, and I actually really like this image um, just because it gives you a really good idea of where we're starting and how close we get up when in a perfect situation when we end. Um, so uh, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, the forward trajectory is pictured here, and we can see that we start off with this t equals zero. This is our input image. It is not noisy. It is a kind of just on its own curve. Then over time, so at, at halfway through t steps, we have a much more noise version. You can see the data is spread out. Um, it is not as clearly defined what is going on in our image. And finally, at time step t, the final time step, um, we get our completely noised image that the model then can learn to regenerate the images from by stepping backwards, which we see in the next row. So if we start with a noised image here, at time step t over 2, we're getting back towards that approximation. And then by the end, we should be able to get a kind of noisy uh, version of the original uh, sample. This is what allows, uh, uh, why is it ablated? I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Can I get back to you on that? Sorry, I'll check at the end of the session um, while we're waiting for our models to load. Um, but it, it was in the paper, I just, I can't recall. Um, so sorry, this, this process is what allows the ADM and Glide to reproduce the features described in the text to a reasonable degree. And uh, I really like this example, this Swiss roll here. 
So now we've seen, you know, uh, on a broad scale how it does it. But how do we actually use the text prompts to influence Glide? We know that it can generate images, but like how, did, how, did, how can we tie that in? Well, Glide has two different methodologies that you can use for influencing the generation process with text. These are the other famous OpenAI model clip um, and the own new proprietary for Glide self-design classifier free guidance function. I'll talk about what both of those do in detail, although I will say that we won't get to the guidance function until we are into the demo. So uh, please try and be patient with me on that. Well, I, we'll talk about it, but we're going to go into much more depth when we get to see the code. OK, uh, really quick, I have a question. Will this recording be uploaded somewhere? Yeah, I plan to upload it to the Paperspace YouTube. So do not worry about that. OK. So Glide with Clip. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, Clip is a really useful model for connecting textual data to visual data. Uh, it's proven time and time again that it is really, really good at that. On the right, we can see an image here of how that works to match the text encodings with the image encodings to enable zero shot prediction. So essentially, we are pairing an image encoder and a text encoder in Clip, and that they use the learned relationship between the two to give us information, or in this case, to enable zero shot prediction. Uh, it is also effective with Glide. It's really effective, frankly, but it suffers from high costs in comparison to the classifier free alternative. Clip is pretty expensive, all things considered. Um, so if we can avoid using Clip, we will almost definitely be able to get a faster model. And that's what they found with this in Glide. Uh, the authors of Glide also posit that the public clip models are insufficiently trained on noise data and are thus unsuitable for use with the ADM in this situation. Um, I think that's reasonable. The publicly available clip models do differ from the ones that they were using for their own uh, internal work. So I wouldn't be surprised if we were to able to make a more robust clip model that was more familiar with this kind of noise data that it would be able to uh, actually outperform the classifier free guidance. The text encoder and image coder concatenated or added. I believe they're concatenated. I believe they are. But I'm not sure off the top of my head. So somebody asked if the text encoder and image encoder are, in cat, are, concat, are concatenated or added. Um, so right here. And I believe it's concatenated. So that's clip. Let's talk about what they recommend we use and what was actually so in one of the other two interest. So there are two interesting things about Glide is the in paint and this, this classifier free guidance is a really nifty piece of code. So what they found was that their classifier free guidance actually outperformed the same model using clip re-ranking. Uh, to do this, they just made a proprietary function that uses the visual portion of the model's own innate understanding of the feature space to pair with and use with the text encodings. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like in the demo and how that works, but it has two really appealing properties. First, it allows a single model, so just the one we're using, to leverage its own understanding and knowledge during guidance rather than relying on the knowledge of a separate and sometimes smaller classification model like CLIP. But the second one is it simplifies guidance when conditioning on information that is difficult to predict with a classifier such as text. So actually super useful for our specific use case. Um, since our classifications are so ridiculously varied thanks to the nature of text, this is a really nice way to help mitigate some of those effects. Like I said, 3.5 billion parameters for the uh, model. All right. So let's put it all together. Essentially, what is happening is first the train model receives a text prompt and guidance parameters and inputs that prompt to a transformer. 
Next, it, uh, this, is the, this is the text processor. Um, next, it uses a random noise image as the initial stage for backwards diffusion. Uh, and the transformer final token embedding is used in place of the class embed. Oh, sorry. Let me reword that. Excuse me. Um, after it inputs the prompt to the transformer, it will initialize with a random noise image to get it started for actually doing the generation process. Then the final uh, token embedding of the transformer is used in place of the class embedding in the ADM model to kind of set the path for the backwards diffusion of the features. So we kind of stage it, so to speak. Um, and that's used, that's done with a function called condefin, which I'll, I'll show in the code. Uh, then the last layer of the token embeddings from the transformer are separately projected to the dimensionality of attention layer of each attention layer throughout the ADM model, and then concatenated to the attention context for each layer. Uh, the ADM then steps backwards to recreate the features described by the text tokens in the feature space. So a little bit more involved version of what I said at the beginning of how it works. So we now see how it all works together. It is able to uh, learn from the text and visual encodings. This is prior to when we get it, when it was trained, and then use those understandings to basically take a noise image and work backwards towards an image that contains what we want it to based on our inputted prompt. Cool. So what does this enable us to do? What can we really do with Glide? Well, Glide is legitimately fantastic for generating realistic images. Um, I found that a lot of different image synthesis procedures have a problem where they have uncanny valley. Uh, other than probably StyleGAN, and StyleGAN 3, obviously, huge improvement. Check it out if you haven't. Um, it runs on Gradient. StyleGAN is probably. Uh, a, a really fantastic example of a image generation procedure that is able to overcome that uncanny valley effect. It actually makes photorealistic images of people. I found that other image generation techniques, um, so specifically I'm talking about the Pixray project and Lafitte right now, were a little more cartoony and difficult to understand. Ooh. I just got a, a good question that I want to briefly answer because it was relevant to the last slide. Uh, somebody asked, just out of curiosity, if as the text prompt, they typed a random string of characters, what would happen? I'm actually not totally sure. Uh, so in order to handle situations where it doesn't understand what is in there, it is actually trained on empty sequences. Um, so 20% of the initial training sequences are images paired with empty captions. So whenever it's faced with a situation it doesn't understand, it has a path to go to randomly generate images. My suspicion is that's what it would do. But when we get to the demo, I would be super excited to try that out because I hadn't thought about it. So after we get through it, I will try that out for everybody. Cool. Back in it. OK. So like I was saying, the images produced by Glide are really nice. I have had some really high quality examples. And as you can see on the right here, look how nice this porcupine and dog look. That is really high quality. Um, yeah. Uh, Mohammed uh, asked a question, output images are not in HD. Any idea or workaround for this? Uh, I haven't built it out yet, but my suspicion is that we would need to make another upsampler model, which would just be a rewriting of, uh, and I'll go over what the upsampler model is in a bit, but basically in, in the code, you can, you, you start off with a 64 by 64 image, and then we upsample it to 256 by 256. That's what it's talking about on this line here. Um, so getting it up to super resolution isn't in the scope of Glide in this current presentation. But I suspect that it would be possible to do with another rewriting of the upsampling. Another person suggested using a super pixel, a super resolution model like Pixel Shuffle SR. Uh, 
Good suggestion. Thank you. Okay, we are almost done, and then we'll jump into the code demo and questions. Um, the images produced are either 64 by 64 or 256 by 256, as I was just saying, and we use an upsampler model to actually upsample all the 64 by 64 images to get those. So uh, the baseline for all three of the models that you could be using, so that is base in paint, base text to M, and base clip, those are the in painting, the classifier free guidance, and the clip guided uh, pair, uh, ways of using Glide. Uh, all three of them have a, another upsampler model version, which you can use in tandem with the base model to upsample it. So you can't get to a point of, I mean, not, not near HD with that size, but it, it, they're still uh, visible and nice to look at for the point of just this demonstration. Um, the next thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned is that Glide can generate images in a plethora of different art styles. I think this is really one of the cooler things that isn't in my top two. Uh, you can look over here on the right. We have all these different art styles. So this whole first row is photorealistic. And then right here, we have a surrealist image, then a high quality oil painting, a cartoony illustration, and even stained glass. That is a super wide uh, depth of understanding for different media. Um, and I think that really speaks to the potential of Glide. Um, next, yes, art style is directly in the prompt. Um, I'm sorry, it's hard to see. Uh, for example, this one right here says, a surrealist dreamlike oil painting by Salvador Dali of a cat playing checkers. So make sure that you include the art style is the prompt. You can have as your prompt basically like a sentence telling you exactly what to do. Um, or it can be phrased or just a descriptor. Um, hmm. I haven't tried pushing the text input and I did not see that listed in the paper. So I don't know the maximum length of the text input either. And to, I had, oh, another good question. Curious if it is possible to generate PDF like worksheets. Are you talking about if you if you were to provide the information, it would then sort it into a thing? I think if you provided this model with enough images of PDF worksheets, then it could it could try and approximate that for sure. You would just be you would be dealing with gibberish words because it's not a language model. So it doesn't actually understand what words it'd be putting into paper. Um, that would be a whole different step. Uh, to get that there. Okay, sorry, I keep getting distracted. These are really, really great questions. Thank you all. Really appreciate your interest. Um, Glide has a few problems though. In particular, and this is the reason I mentioned StyleGAN earlier, it struggles with human and animal faces. Uh, I could not get around that. I tried multiple times to upload an image of myself when I was clean shaven and adding in a mustache and had no luck. So uh, if you would like to do something with the in painting feature on a human, just keep in mind that it's going to struggle. And I'll show you what that looks like when we get to the demo as well. So next is in painting. Um, I've talked about this several times throughout the presentation. So thanks for your patience. Glide is really, really good at editing photos within the photos based on text prompts. It requires you to mask the area that you want to change, but it's still able to have the innate knowledge of the entire image to put that together with your text prompt and make fabulous additions and changes. So for example, here, I started with this grass.png. This is the provided um, sample image for inpainting. And I masked about, I believe it was 40 out of 64 of it, um, 40 of the 64 pixels up. Um, and then I told it to add a small house on fire. And I think it did decently. Uh, it's more like a house with a fire. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that it's not aggressively capable at dealing with things that it doesn't really understand. So I think this example in the picture is actually a really poignant place to talk about that. Um, 
what's going on here is that we have an image of grass taken at an angle like you were facing towards it at say 30 degrees. Um, we are not looking at it as you would uh, flat to the ground. It is, it has a, percep a perceived angle to it. So it would be very difficult to put an image of a house that we took from a flat angle. If we were looking dead on at home, there's no way that you would be able to have the model understand on its, I, from just the MS Coco training, how to change and shift its perspective of looking at that. That kind of shifting is not within the scope of the image generation or its understanding of the model. What it does instead is add in a whole new plane of grass. Keep in mind, it, it tried to mimic a lot of the grass like up, up until just below where the thing started. This is almost identical to what it actually had. And then it's got this new grass, which is a different shade, and it's got the house sitting vertically. So it's actually pretty smart about how it tries to fit things in. Um, what it can't do though, is again, deal with those biological situations. So I, I'm in particular bringing this up because they do it a lot in their sample where they do in photo editing like this and it's super high quality. Uh, there is a, another additional model they use to make this happen. And in the future, I'm gonna try and implement this, but for now, we're just using a simple mask on a portion of the image. So bear in mind that is likely causing, causing, creating the difference between what you are doing and what they showed off in the paper. Um, Jose Marugo has a, a good suggestion here. Is the struggle on human faces a result of the pre-trained models? Maybe with human faces, pre-trained models, it will perform better. I think so too. I just think that the MS Coco it wasn't in the scope with what they did there. There are people in it. It's just not, it's not focused on facial images. Um, particular things about faces, like uh, I believe it's eyes, noses, mouths, dimples, and a few other features are really, really difficult for machine learning models to understand. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head exactly why that is. But that's why you tend to see uh, image generation that works specifically with facial models or animal models like StyleGAN are entirely trained on data sets like, like AFHQ or the Animal Faces high quality data set or Celeb A or something like that. They, they are always, uh, basically if we wanted to do that, we would have to introduce a whole new subsection to the data set it's trained on and I'm not totally sure that that wouldn't interfere with the rest of its capabilities. Um, it would need to learn to dif differentiate between a face and a building. Um, and we can infer that it would, I just don't know for sure that it, it would on its own, um, just because of the, the common difficulties I see with faces. But I think that could be a solution is training on human faces. Uh, and finally, is there a catalog of art styles that would be recognized? No. Not to my knowledge. Um, I think you would be better off. No, you know what? I would suspect that it might actually be able to handle that. I could not speak to the difference between Bruegel the Elder and Bruegel the Younger, but uh, uh, my suspicion is, and also sorry if I butchered that pronunciation, my suspicion is that it, it actually may be able to do that. I think that you would be better off and would get more accuracy though, if you used broader terms for artistic styles. So impressionism, abstract, or even the medium, watercolor, oil paint, pixel drawing, things like that will be more likely to have that kind of profound effect on the art style. All right, um, since we have just 10 minutes left, and seriously, thanks for all these wonderful questions. Um, let's quickly, run through the code for inpaint so that you can actually have an understanding of what we are doing here in more physical detail. Sorry, I'm pausing because I'm moving things around. All right, so back in our gradient notebook, can I get Bs in the chat? Uh, for those of you that were running inpaint or doing the run Python scripted that it ran. 
Um, and you'll know either that it ran for Python scripted, it will show up as a, uh, a file here. I believe it's in paint.jpg. Yeah, so here's my watercoloring coloring of the Taj Mahal. Uh, and if you are in the actual image, it'll just display below it. Oh. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> um, I see somebody pointing out that the progress bar is pretty messed up in paper space. Uh, that is that is something that is currently going on. Um, it may, if it's just stuck there, I'm not, I don't think that's a progress bar. More likely there was some sort of download error. I've had that happen to me once. Um, so I would suggest that you go into run Python scripted. When it runs in the terminal, the progress bar works with the terminal language. So um, also just so you are all aware, that is coming in the next week or so. So get excited. This will all be functional in a week. It's just, this is just, this run Python script is just a stopgap in case we ran into these kind of issues. But our, our super genius engineers are making this working. You're in the scripted version and it's running into that. Okay, my, sus my suspicion then, Andrew, is that there was some sort of download error. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what happened. I, I apologize that happened to you. Um, yeah, I suspect that's that's it. Uh, and the URL. Jay, are you asking for the URL to the slides? I'll just put everything. Um, at the beginning, I showed how to create a, uh, a notebook with this. Jay, you may not have been here for that. I'm just gonna put the text instructions for that. And if you're still having trouble making the notebook, let me know and I will help you make one at the end. But here are the text instructions for making a notebook with this. And I'll, I'll be staying on after to do that. So don't worry about that. But let's quickly run through this so everybody that needs to go in eight minutes can. Um, and then I will answer the rest of everybody's questions. So here we are in inpaint.ipymb file. Um, the first cell we have here, um, this is what installs the libraries, I mean, the relevant package, uh, sorry, functions from the Glide text to image uh, GitHub repo, which we're installing with pip. Uh, you only need to run this in one of your notebooks um, and make sure that you have installed our fork. So it'll say gradient dash AI here instead of the open AI fork, uh, original repo. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem if you follow my instructions to start this, but I just wanted to make sure. Uh, the OpenAI version actually has a problem which breaks when you run this on gradient. So I went in and, and fixed it. So now it should work perfectly for us. Uh, next, we've got our imports uh, of particular interest. I'm just going to point out the torch and our relevant glide text to image functions. Um, so we got load checkpoint to load in our model create model and diffusion to instantiate our model and diffusion procedure, model and diffusion defaults to assign those defaults um, to the model, and model and diffusion defaults upsampler. So same thing, but for the upsampler version. Next, we've got a cell here where we're just doing some quick variable assignment to make sure that our model will be able to use the GPU we've enabled because we're on a gradient notebook. We definitely want to take advantage of the power. Um, so we're doing has CUDA assigned to th.cuda is available and setting device to CUDA as well. And we'll use those down here to set our model to run with the GPU and to use FP16 because uh, it can result in better performance where half precision is enough. But, and here just to go into more detail about this actual cell, this next cell is where we create our base model. Um, the first thing we do is instantiate our options using the model and diffusion defaults. This options we can then put in as uh, our parameter for the create model and diffusion. So the first thing we do is set inpaint to true. That's because this notebook is going to be used for an inpainting task. We're going to use FP16 to has CUDA. And we're going to set our time step, step respacing to, let's just do 100 so it's fast. 100 is the recommended time for fast. I suggest you should try noodling around with it. I had some variable results, including some that were better in 200 to 300. 
But this 100 on a free GPU should run in about a minute. So I think this is a good example. Uh, so once that's done, we use these keywords arguments uh, to with create model and diffusion to in instantiate our model and diffusion. Then we set our model to evaluation mode so we can run inference with it, set it to run with our GPU, and then finally use load checkpoint to load in the base and paint checkpoint. And then um, we are printing out the total number of base parameters, which is a little under 4 billion. Next, we have the up sampler model. Uh, this wasn't covered in the presentation too far. I, I, did, I know I did briefly mention it, uh, just in the interest of time. But the up, up sampler model behaves very similarly to the base model. Um, this allows it to take the base model image synthesis process and then up sample it to a larger image size, in this case, 256 by 256 pixels. So this one is 64 by 64. This is 256 by 256. Um, here in this next cell, we've got some helper functions. Show images will display the image after the cell, and read image lets us read it in as a tensor. And finally, we get to the sampling parameters. Um, I'm going to change this, actually, because we can just, we'll do the, uh, we'll, I'll show you why, uh, why it doesn't work with faces later, but here's a nice selfie of me. So our sampling parameters are going to be the prompt, the guidance scale, and the batch size in particular. The batch size is less important. Uh, the prompt is kind of speaks for itself. It is the thing that defines how our image generation process is going to go. Our image generation process is always trying to work towards that caption. Um, batch size just determines how many to load in. And guidance scale determines how much we are letting the classifier free guidance function impart its effect on the uh, image generation process. And I'll show you where it does that in a little bit. Um, but if it's greater than or equal to one, it will have some sort of effect to impart the caption uh, onto the image. Uh, here we have upsample temp. This just controls the sharpness of the uh, 256 by 256 images. I recommend just leaving this alone. I, I, I also found that it caused some grainy artifacting when I raised it. Okay. And. Oh. Ah, sorry, I, I neglected to say something about the guiding scale. Um, if one is inputted, Glad would. Uh, if anything less than one is inputted, Glide would produce a random addition to the image. This gets into what I was talking about earlier about during training, 20% of the text sequences were replaced with empty sequences. Um, this allowed the model to basically randomly start creating things whenever it didn't have some prompt to guide it. Okay. And, and it also enables a large part of our, uh, our, our sampling, which I'll show you in a bit. Next, we load in our source images in size 256 and 64. Um, and that read image helper function lets us do that in both the sizes. Uh, these are then used to produce the source masks. Uh, these can be used to identify the regions of the image to be edited for the model. And you can see that just by multiplying these together in the show images, we can see what happens when I apply the mask to my image. So here I'm taking out 54 over 64. So uh, or sorry, the inverse of that, taking out 10 of 64 of the image of uh, the pixels um, and identifying that area for my model later to be used as the area to be in painted. And so we can just change this up as much as we want. You know, if I want to show less or more or show more of the grass, which is really what I need to show you here, we can do that. So uh, since I want to show quite a bit of this, let's do half. And we're going to have a corgi running through a field. This is a very popular um, caption that was used frequently throughout the paper. Um, so I, I figured this would be a really good uh, demonstration example. Um, yeah, got the source mass. Cool. So now we can jump into actually sampling from the models. 
So exciting. So the first thing we do here uh, in our, and I'll, I'll just quickly walk through the model before we do it, is uh, it takes in the prompts as a token, uh, it takes in the prompt as tokens in a mask, and then matches the token mask to the masked area in the image. We also create another, uh, well, it will do that later, sorry. We also create another set of empty tokens to help with the classifier free guidance here. Uh, these are packed together as the model keyword arguments, along with the inpaint image and inpaint mask, which is just a, a repeated version of the source image uh, mask and, uh, and the source mask itself that we showed earlier. Um, lost my place. Ah. And then we have our model function. So this is the classifier-free guidance sampling function that I talked about as outperforming CLIP in the presentation. Uh, in practice, because this is a little bit difficult to interpret, uh, it takes a fully noise image and the total diffusion steps as inputs, as well as our, in, our model keyword arguments. The function then calculates and assigns to some variables the portions of the image that are relevant to recreating the caption, and then uses this inferred understanding to return a new tensor that lies closer to that described in the caption. And this guides the generated image closer. And it does this at each step uh, in the backwards diffusion. The denoise function further helps, this is the one just below it, by forcing the model to have the exact right predictions for the Im initial image state for the parts that are known. So i.e. it will always be able to perfectly regenerate the grass portion of this grass picture. Um, the top still visible grass portion. To actually run the image generation process, we then just do diffusion.p sample loop, which takes in our model fn as the function, uh, the model, and that will run to produce our 64 by 64 image. So let's run this really quick. As you can see here, it doesn't work great with faces. I had told it to put in a yellow t shirt. And it did not add in a yellow t-shirt before me. It just kind of tried to put something, but it was not sure what to do. So that's what I'm talking about with it messing up with people. It's not just their faces. It doesn't know how to use them in general unless it is a full body. So they have examples uh, in their, oh, I should get this run, sorry. They have examples in their presentation of you know people skiers getting ready. So these are both made by Glide. A uh, group of skiers preparing to ski down a mountain. You're not seeing any faces or uh, distinct features of these people other than enough to tell that they're wearing ski coats and have skis and maybe like a helmet. Uh, it's not actually getting into the nitty gritty understanding of what's going on with them. It just knows that skiers look like this. So it prints that out. Oh, that's one of the worst running corgis I've seen yet. We're running that again. But at the end of the day, that's what you get. You get a, that whole bottom portion of the image was added in with a new corgi running through it, even though it's got deformed legs. And that's how you perform in painting. Now, if you wanna do this sort of uh, image generation without starting with a photo and you just want to uh, make something uh, from the image, you can do that in text to M. Keep in mind, this has an entirely different model, but once it's done downloading after 30 minutes, it's really nice. So here's a, here's a, a, a oil painting I made of a horse. Really nice. Uh, okay, we are getting really close to time and I wanna give everybody a chance to ask questions, but there is one last thing we need to go over, which is how you can edit your own photos. So we saw earlier that I was doing uh, in, in editing on this picture of my face. <laughs> um, to do that, all you need to do is upload your own image and then link the path to it. So to upload your own image within a gradient notebook, down here in the bottom left, there's this up arrow into a cloud icon, which will let you upload files. I've got some just example faces I have here just from pexel.com. So I'm just gonna use this guy here well, I've already uploaded it, but you'll get my point. And then I'm going to add in some new prompt. Let's do, um, uh, man, 
this will be uploaded to the paper space or hello paper space YouTube. I can link to that in just a moment. Let me just finish with this run through. Uh, man with a centaur body. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of something that would be absurd. <laughs> then simply replace the string here with the uh, the value we want it to. So in this case, it would go from grass.png to diff2.jpg. And then I think I actually have to run all on this one. OK, wait one sec. Sorry, sorry. I made a copy of this earlier, and I seem to have confused myself with it. Oh, bizarre. OK, so run this. And it, it squishes the photo and cuts down to just half. And I'm hoping if things somehow went correctly, that the model would then take my prompt of a man with a centaur body and pretty much draw out the rest of his face and then a horse beneath him. It won't. Um, I haven't had luck there with people. But if you have a more blank image, kind of like this grass.png, some sort of backdrop, then I definitely recommend uploading that and trying in painting with that. There's also some, there's also a procedure described in the paper, um, which I will now link to everybody. Um, in there, you can find how they actually did their more complicated mapping of where to do it. So they were actually able to identify very specific regions to change. High, much, much higher degree of uh, specificity than we were operating with. Um, I'm going to try and implement this myself, so look out for it in coming weeks. But uh, definitely encourage everybody to play around with that themselves. Uh, with that, we are now done with the session. Uh, you should now be able to um, use the instructions, which I will reshare now. to create this notebook here. Uh, or the, basically the exact same notebook, and then run this whole process, including uploading your own images to be used with the inpainting procedure. Uh, just saw a question. Is there a GUI-based approach to have the non-rectangular inpatient regions? Yeah, so uh, where we are creating the source mask um, here, you could try and essentially like make one out of the array that we are making here in the same format. So here I'm telling it to only in, uh, to block off half of the image. We could get even more granular with that, make little changes like this. Oh, no, not. Sorry, I actually don't. I can't remember off the top of my head how the array works. Um, but I do know that we can make changes like that. That is essentially what they are doing. Yeah, that is the kind of, uh, and, and Uma's example is exactly it. Man with green hair uh, to red hair. Well, I think he actually had brown hair and they highlighted it green. Um, and they talk about how they do that in here, but it wasn't in the scope of this presentation to implement. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, I put in the instructions for setting up this notebook into the chat. I'm going to put that in just one more time because I think everybody would benefit from it. At the very end of that, you have the link to the presentation. You can also, oh, does that work? Oh, I'm sorry, it didn't, it didn't do the entire link. Please excuse me. I thought it was odd that that URL ended in a hyphen. That seemed not normal. OK, now you have the full instructions along with the link. Uh, within that link, you can access all the sources I used for this conversation, um, and you can also get access to the original paper. Uh, I will be uploading this video to our YouTube, which is at hello paper space here. Um, so be sure to look out for that in the coming days. Huh, Andrew, I'd be glad. I'd be glad to like workshop this. That's interesting. I've never, I haven't run into that, and I've, 
I've, I've, I feel like I've broken Grady in every way I can. So that's an interesting uh, point. Um, so it re-downloads the model every time you run it. Interesting. I wonder if that's a parameter. No. Huh. Can you enable edit? Try to copy paste instruction. Oh, uh, yeah, just because we're all on a copy, I'm happy to do that. This isn't my final version. Um, shoot, how do I do that? OK. Huh. OK, I, I will, I'm going to put it into the, the notes for before we get started. Um, the link to the YouTube and the instruction notes. And I will try and make this editable. Sorry about that, Jay. Uh, a really good suggestion, though. And also, sorry I missed your question. Were you still able to follow along? And uh, Uma, I think. I think uh, Andrew is actually saying that he was doing the script version, but it was still breaking. Um, IPy widgets will be out very, very soon. Um, so hopefully that shouldn't be a problem. If any of you are running into this, feel free to, uh, to message me. I will try and work along with you. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Definitely a good call on the refreshing. Um, okay, one more question from Aleem. Are you still here, Aleem? No, I missed you. Shoot. Uh, he he asked if it would be able to differentiate between Western and Eastern styles. I don't think it has. It's, I, I'm sure you could rewrite this to be more of a discriminator. That would be really interesting. Uh, but not, not with its current makeup. You could not just have it differentiate. But it wouldn't just spit that out for you. Um, I didn't see where it uploaded the image. Took forever because of downloading. I yeah yeah, that's the other thing. Um, we're working on the file manager, but if you're clip.jpg or inpaint.jpg or whatever, uh, which it has different outputs for each of the three, um, and you can actually, just so everybody knows, um, you can go into these scripted versions, and at the very bottom, I've got the file names in case it isn't clear. So inpaint will give you inpaint.jpg. The very first one in the run scripted is run clip. So clip.jpg. And then, uh, oh, sorry, text m will give you text to m.jpg. Um, ah, Hojat, thank you. Let's do it. Let's do it right now. Do I have everything downloaded? I'm pretty sure I do. I'm pretty sure I do. Uh, okay, let's do it with uh, their classifier free guidance because I'm pretty sure I already know what uh, the other one would do. And was this an out of memory error? Oh, good thing if you're still here. If you are running on this page and you get an out of memory error, restart your kernel <laughs> up here in the top right. That has happened to me. So keep in mind, uh, working on a free GPU, it can, it can run out of memory. So I have submitted a pure gibberish. Let's do uh, let's make this more random. Uh, let's do percent. All right, I've got a pure gibber gibberish input string prompt, and I'm very excited to see what it'll do. This may take a minute. Uh, are there any other questions that I may have missed? Please let me know, because I know I was saying a lot there at the end. <laughs> I'm very curious what this is going to do. Oh, no. OK, it wants me to install. I, I When I restarted this, I didn't install the uh, thing this morning. So let me try doing that in InPaint. And we'll just uh, mask the entire image. That should work. Yeah, that should work. Let's do, uh, oh, 
get that gibberish back. Or, oops. All right. That white. Right, bear with me, y'all. This should be masking the entire image, but it's not all of a sudden. Oh, I guess it wants me to just do that. Add that backwards. Pardon. All right. Now we can test our gibberish theory. Also, this is what happened with the man with the centaur, by the way. It did not end up as a man with a centaur body. In fact, that looks like a horseshoe to me or something and spurs. I think it's just really... Really did its best, but it has no idea what to do. And it just reflected the, the plants here because it, I think it just defaults that when it detects a plane in the background, it tries to continue the plane. Um, yeah. Ooh, interesting. That looks like a medicine bottle or something. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, so. I suspect that this is a completely random uh, image generation paradigm. So if we run this again with the exact same random uh, noisy prompt, it will once again do a completely different random image. If not, then our classifier free guidance is uh, ascribing this uh, the pill bottle description to, uh, to uh, the, the gibberish. And that's interesting in its own right and worth investigating. Uh, okay, we are now 16 minutes over. If you would like to see how this last experiment goes with the random, please stay on, but I definitely recommend everybody go back to their day now. We are done with the session. Thank you so, so much for participating. Y'all have been wonderful. This has been my biggest webinar with, uh, or tech talk with Paperspace so far, and it's, it was great. Really happy with how this went down. So thank you so much for your great questions and participation. Uh, I've once again put in the chat the instructions for setting up this notebook and uh, everything. Looking forward to hearing from you, Uma. Thanks again for coming. Thanks, Ringo. Yeah, thanks, David, or David. David, is it David or David? And you too, Dave, and Agatha, and Joe. Oh yeah, Hojat. We did it. It's beans. It's completely random. <laughs> so uh, that's where you get your empty, empty prompt from. Um, completely, yeah. That's what it does with empty sequences. Uh, thank you, Jose. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, glad you thought so, Paul. Thanks for coming. And very cool, David. I, I miss living in the UK. Never got to go to Hungary though. That's a good half-life. All right, everybody, I have to excuse myself now, um, but thank you so much again. This was wonderful. Look out for my next Tech Talk next month. I do it at the last week of every month, usually on a Wednesday. Uh, you all should get the invitation though. So can't wait to see you all again and have a great week. Thanks Rumiko. Bye everybody.